We start with two images. The first, an actual photograph of four presidents and their wives. The photograph was taken by Paul Morse at the funeral for Barbara Bush. In the center, you can see George H.W. Bush. Behind him, his son George and his wife Laura, his arm around the Clintons. On the edge, Melania Trump and Michelle Obama, arm in arm. The other image, you're gonna have to conjure for yourself. The sitting president, Donald Trump, at Mar-a-Lago, tweeting 29 times since Friday about Michael Cohen, James Comey, Michael Flynn, the special counsel, about a former aide that he calls drunk and drugged up loser, and what he calls a third-rate reporter named Maggie Haberman. He insists that she is someone who I don't speak to and have nothing to do with, but there they are in the Oval Office. She has interviewed him multiple times. To talk more about all of this, I want to welcome in my panel the co-founder of Foundry Strategies and MSNBC political analyst Rick Tyler, Pulitzer Prize winning White House reporter for The Washington Post and MSNBC contributor, my friend Ashley Parker, NBC News intelligence and national security reporter Ken Delanian, and White House correspondent for PBS NewsHour and MSNBC contributor Yamish Alcindor. Ashley, I'll give you the first word because this is the first time I've seen you on the air since uh, on this show since you won your Pulitzer last week. Congratulations to Thank you and you. all of your <laughs> colleagues uh, at The Washington Post. But we've talked a lot about this theme that the president is isolated and, and increased Increasingly, as time has worn on, he seems to be more and more isolated. I think it, it certainly set into sharp relief for me that the difference between that photograph where he was obviously uh, excluded and what has gone on over the course of the weekend. Do you think this is the most isolated time yet for this president? Yes and no. I mean, if you look at his West Wing and his White House, there's been stunning turnover, um, and not just across the board, but some of these people who are really sort of comforts to him. Hope Hicks, his trusted communications advisor. Keith Schiller, his longtime bodyguard, um, who played a key role there. Uh, a number of people who he really knew and was familiar with and liked. That said, um, he still does what he's always done, which is he's always had a kind of small group of people around him. Um, and he still stays in touch with them late at night on the phone when he's down at Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> Going around John Kelly, his ostensible e operator. Exactly. So he's <laughs> surrounded by people. It might not be the people his chief of staff wants him to be surrounded surrounded by, but he's mm -hmm. not purely isolated. Ken Delanian, what, what potential damage has the president done with these, these tweets that have been sort of aimed across the board? I think Chuck Todd was talking this morning on Meet the Press about how it feels like the, the, the focus is, you know, Russia, 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 the weight of this investigation sort of pressing down more on the president and the country as a whole. You mean aside from damage to our national fabric, Casey? <laughs> I mean, look, it, it makes him look guilty, I, I think, at the end of the day. I mean, the way he is continuing to attack anyone that he feels can hurt him in the Russia investigation, anybody that seems to be a witness. Um, although, interestingly, he hasn't attacked Michael Cohen yet because he believes that his lawyer and longtime confidant may be on the fence and there may be a chance he could flip and there's a chance he, he, he might not flip. And Donald Trump seemed to have could some words himself, of support right. for him this week. You mean, just weigh in on this question. I mean, what was your take? I mean, we watched and, and talked so much, and we'll talk a little bit more about Barbara Bush later on in the show, but sort of the, the, the dignity and, and grace that, that she showed on the national stage and the contrast with, you know, the events of the last year. I think there are two things. The first is there is this kind of stunning moment where President Trump said, people keep saying, I'm going to fire Robert Mueller, I'm going to fire Rod Rosenstein, and then, or Rod Rosenstein, and then, but they still are here. There's still people that are working, um, and I haven't fired them. And that it felt like for a couple moments there, I would say, I won't venture to say a whole day, that people thought, oh, these people are going to have their jobs. They're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> and then Friday night, when he starts tweeting about James Comey setting off the special, investi special investigation and special counsel, and he talks about this idea that like it, it's built off of an illegal act. So what does that mean? It started to feel like, okay, so is he now building a case or dropping crumbs for why he's going to fire these two men and why he's going to try to stop this investigation? That, so there's that one thing. The other thing is that during a funeral, right, while, while everyone was watching the bushes, while everyone was, was kind of reminiscing on what the quorum is like and how beautiful the, the, the casket, and just like, just every, I think the nation as a whole was kind of pausing to think about all of those things. You had mm -hmm. Donald Trump go on a rant of all rants that really show that the Republican Party is in completely 
different hands now. This is not the Bushes. And as much as people might have made fun of, of George Bush and he had his own issues with Katrina and the war in Iraq, people never thought he was someone who just didn't have any decorum, who just kind of was tearing away, like you said, at the national well, fabric. Well, certainly, and, I think you're yeah. right. There has been some George W. Bush nostalgia that has some people maybe papering <laughs> over some of the things that we, we remember of his presidency at the time. I mean, Rick Tyler, what's your take on that? I, I think Yamisha's point is a good one, that perhaps it is, you know, those people in the photograph who are going to be the ones that are permanently outside the frame. Many of those people ran against each other, but they were, able, they were still able to appear in the same room at the same time. They hadn't diminished or demeaned themselves to the point where it just would be embarrassing. Now, the White House, a little bit of cover saying, you know, the Secret Service would have created a disruption on the funeral, and it would have. Um, but I think uh, Trump's presence there would have created a much larger disruption, disruption. And I do think the Bushes, who I've disagreed with many, many times, but it's hard to argue that they aren't uh, honorable people. I remember visiting the uh, Bush Library, which you can argue is a propaganda place, but... Perhaps any presidential yes, library everyone, presents but, the best history possible of... But I read a letter by uh, George H.W. Bush to his boys during Watergate, and he was very concerned about the way his boys would perceive Watergate, and it was a father uh, instructing his younger sons, and it was about character and honor and, and dignity, and we're lacking that in this White House right now. Mm. So speaking of those tweets, uh, in a series of other tweets throughout the weekend, the president is questioning the legality of the special counsel, claiming that James Comey illegally leaked classified documents. He also slighted his own attorney general, quote, GOP lawmakers asking Sessions to investigate Comey and Hillary Clinton. Good luck with that request. Meanwhile, The Washington Post reports Jeff Sessions warned the White House he might have to leave his job if President Trump fired his deputy, Rod Rosenstein. On the call, reportedly to Don McGahn last weekend, Sessions expressed the difficult position it would put him in. The call came after Rosenstein approved the raid on Cohen's offices and home. Ken Delanian, uh, what are the ramifications of these potential dominoes? If Sessions really does think, well, if, if Rosenstein goes, I'd have to resign too. I personally do not think that the Congress would approve another attorney general uh, in the first place. Uh, but that aside, I mean, it, it seems like that would in fact sparked the crisis based on this report. Absolutely. And they certainly <laughs> wouldn't approve an attorney general without that person promising to continue the Mueller investigation as it's happening. So, but leaving that aside, I mean, actually, one of the things, the implications of this session threatening to resign was, I was wondering, is that, is that a motivating factor for Donald Trump to make <laughs> exactly. this happen, right? But look, that, that would absolutely cause a crisis in Congress and in the executive branch. Now, Donald Trump could put acting people in who could potentially uh, remove Robert Mueller. But as James Comey said many times, this week, you, you would have to fire the entire Justice Department and the entire FBI to make this investigation go away. The documents, the findings, those would just simply go, if Mueller was removed, they would go to U.S. attorney's offices, the FBI. What it is, but every few days or so, or at least every week, we seem to get a new round of, okay, the president is about to prepare to do this, or another report that says, you know, he thought about firing Mueller at such and such additional time. Wh where does that stand right now? How secure is Rod Rosenstein? Well, I think first to understand it, we sort of have to put it in context, which is the president often and sort of floats ideas and bounces things off of aides and friends and says, you know, I'm, I'm so fed up with him. I think I should fire him. What do you think? Do you think I should fire him? Um, and, that doesn't, do no. <laughs> and that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen. And as Yamish mentioned earlier, he said in that press conference, you know, look, people have been writing these stories for four or five months, and these two men are still here aren't they? Um, and that's true. And there is sort of an adage people say, pay attention to what the president says, not what he does. Although sometimes he he does do the thing he's saying, such right. as firing James Comey. So it, it's tenuous. Right. And you bring up Comey as well. I mean, and, and I want to play a soundbite that we have from Susan Collins on Meet the Press uh, this morning, because it seems to me that in some ways Comey did some damage to himself over the course of the last week. Take a look. I cannot imagine why an FBI director would seek to essentially cash in on a book when the investigation is very much alive. He should have waited to do his memoir. I think this is an interesting assessment from a senator who is, by all accounts, you know, carries some antipathy towards Donald Trump. And she raises a question, we talked about this initially, that does this potentially, uh, and Ken Delaney, and I'm interested to know your opinion on the impact on the investigation, but politically, Rick Tyler, do you think that, that James Comey did himself well over the course of the last week? Is he, did he survive politically at the, as the stand-up, courageous guy that he set out to paint a portrait of in his book? 
I think it's kind of a break even. But we have to remember something. James Comey was fired. They, they took away a man's career, a, a prosecutorial career that went all the way back to when he worked uh, for Rudy Giuliani and before that. So they took away his career. They also disper besmirched him publicly. So I think he had a right to come out and, and make his case. And his case couldn't be done in sound bites. I've read his book. Um, I disagree with some of the things Comey has done and said. Did he make a mistake? And he seems to think he maybe made a mistake in writing about the size of the president's hands, his hair, or some other things. Look, I'm, I'm sure the publisher had more to do with that than James Comey did. Um, because, he certainly did take us inside the room. Yeah, no, but I think the book is interesting, and the book it, it does give a, a justification of why he did a separate conf uh, press conference from the Justice Department about reopening the, um, the investigation of Hillary Clinton's emails, which I profoundly disagree with. But he has a rationale for that, and people can decide on their own. Um, but I, I think, on balance, um, he probably broke even. Ken, is your take that he potentially did any damage to himself as a witness, potentially uh, for Bob Mueller or not? I think that there's a potential for that, absolutely. I, I mean, in terms of the impact of the investigation, I think that if Mueller didn't want this to happen, really put his foot down, it wouldn't have happened. So it's not that these words are going to sort of interfere with the investigation, but the damage that he may have done to his credibility with, as you say, you know, going to the size of Donald Trump's hands and the color of his skin and, and just appearing to be cashing in, although I agree with everything Rick said, I think Susan Collins is raised a fair question. To the extent that he is a crucial witness in any obstruction of justice case to be made against Donald Trump, I think this could do some damage, yeah. And Yamish, with the memos coming out after the book was released, I mean, the memos do seem to add credibility uh, to, you know, whatever may have been taken away from him uh, from, you know, his references that some people interpreted as eh, maybe below the belt uh, takes. The memos coming out and Republicans were clamoring for them. It seemed to, in some ways, damage the Republican case and bolster Comey's credibility. Would you say that's right? I'm not sure because I think it's so. It was such a partisan response to these to these memos. You had Republicans jumping and running, saying, "Look, it, it shows that he, that this is not obstruction of justice." You had Nancy Pelosi tweeting, "Actually, this shows that Donald Trump has a contempt for the rule of law." I think as a reporter, I saw someone. Not only, of course, we knew about all the details in the memo, but there's this part where Comey, where James Comey basically says that, yeah, I told him I would give him honest loyalty. We had heard that before, but then he says, well, he called me back maybe a couple months later, a couple weeks later, and said, you remember that thing about loyalty I told you about? And James Comey basically says, like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And it, to me, it, it tells you that James Comey's trying to hold on to his job. He's trying to outlast his presidency. He's thinking of his career, saying, 10 years down mm -hmm. the line, I want this to be a, a whole thing that I can close and I can, I can serve. But in reality, I think that if he's looking back, he's probably, I think, doesn't feel as great at the, at the idea that he had that loyalty held hanging over his head because it, the, the memos don't paint him as someone who's saying, Donald Trump, you cannot say that. This is completely unethical. That's just not there. So I don't know if it's really helped his credibility. Ashley, what's your take on that? Do, do you think that the, the memos bolstered uh, Comey's stature and case across the board, or is Yumi right? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, my understanding, and again, I'm not a legal expert, is that those sorts of memos that are written extemporaneously um, can be used basically as as proof of something having happened, um, right. and, and they would be very valuable to Robert Mueller and his team of investigators. Um, and the memos sort of do bol bolster his account of what did happen. He's sort of been very consistent in that and what leaked out in the news reports and what we then saw. Um, but as Yumi said, I do think everything is sort of at this point seen through a partisan lens so people will sort of pick and choose what they want to take from that. They also came out in response to the Republican investigators who, who want these hundreds of thousands and perhaps millions of documents that Rosenstein has no hope of fulfilling in any time in the future, which will set up a pretext of why he needs to be fired. And there's talk of the Republicans trying to impeach right. him. So he sends, okay, then I'll send over the Comey memos, which he does. And what happens? Within one hour, they are leaked. I mean, these <laughs> supposedly illegal classified memos, and now everybody gets to read them. They're, they're a whole lot of nothing, really. And, uh, you know, so what do, what do you think the FBI is, what do you think is going to happen when the FBI sends over a million documents, many of which will be classified? They're going to leak. Yeah, well, that's what Capitol Hill's best at sometimes. <laughs> As we mentioned, the president has tweeted 29 times since Friday. We know, certainly I know, it can be hard to keep up. So we here at KCDC distilled them to under 20 seconds for you, and oh, we put them in the president's own words, almost. Nancy Pelosi yeah. called numbers. James Comey, which on Maggie Haberman, Sylvester Stallone, drunk, drugged up. Loser. The Washington Post. Kim Jong Un, Southern White House. Debbie 
Wasserman Schultz. Mr. Papers, Jack Johnson. And the dishonest media. The dishonest media. Much more to come on our show tonight. <laughs> hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.